be just to make sure. Alex, do you want to test your mic to make sure you can be heard? You come off mute. Alex, we're waiting for you to test your mic because we are going live in a second. <laughs> Alex, can you hear us? I'm chatting with him on the side, so I'm just going to see. Okay, so I'll start in any event. Okay, so it's 2 p.m. now. Um, good afternoon, uh, panelists. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my name is Tobinna Erojikwe. I'm the chairman of the governing board of the MBA Institute of Continuing Legal Education. I'm delighted to have you all here today. Uh, it's a very special day because it's one of our collaborations with the uh, NLNG Learning Academy. And we have uh, as facilitators today, a team of experts, from Allen and Overy. Uh, they've graciously agreed to take us on challenges and opportunities of structuring for tech innovation. And I expect that is going to be an, a very interesting and illuminating session. I'll just do a quick introduction of the speakers for today. And then I'll invite Mr. Olubida Abata, who is the past president of the MBA to make opening remarks before then handing over to the speakers for today. So our speakers for today are William Samengo Turner and Alex Shango. Now, William's as a, a Alan Overy's co-head of technology for EMEA, Will's practice focuses on a wide range of corporate and commercial matters within the tech sector and its related industries, both in EMEA and the United States. From emerging enterprises and startups to large public corporations, he advises some of the world's leaders in technology on a range of issues, including M&As, JVs, private fundraising, and digital transformation. A member of a &O's London corporate team, Will has spent considerable time living and working in Silicon Valley, and he continues to split his time between London and the Bay Area. His experience on the West Coast includes a wide variety of M&A and financing transactions for corporations of varying sizes and stages of development, ranging from seed round investments in startups to major acquisitions and disposals by listed multinational companies and is particularly adept at navigating the challenges of transatlantic deal making. Will is also a leader of the firm's digitization practice, advising clients at all stages of development and across a broad range of sectors on challenges and opportunities brought about by digital disruption and innovation in their markets. Alex Sandro. Alex specializes in technology and data focused transactions. This includes advising on the technology and data aspects of M&A, growth capital and joint venture transactions, as well as standalone commercial arrangements, such as collaborations, licenses, service agreements, and software development. Alex works in all sectors with a particular focus on IP and data rich sectors, such as life sciences, technology, financial services and telecoms. Alex is a specialist in the legal issues arising from artificial intelligence and different ways in which different types of AI model use data. Alex brings his knowledge, this knowledge to the firm's clients who are increasingly seeking to build access or acquire AI capabilities. I will now call on the immediate past president of the MB Nigerian Bar Association, Mr. Olumida Bata to make his opening remarks before then handing over to Wills and Alex. Thank you very much. Mr. Patari, okay, good. Thank you, Tabena. Can you hear me? Can you see me? We can hear you, we can see you. Excellent. Um, 
So I'm, I want to say thank you, a big thank you to um, the NBA Institute of Continuing Legal Education for inviting me to give opening remarks at this very important uh, webinar, um, which I consider to be a, a phenomenal importance to the practice of law, not just in Nigeria, but um, uh, across, across, the, across the world, really. Um, but firstly, let me say how proud I am of the ICLE um, and its achievements so far. I must give kudos to Tobin Nairo Jikwe, our chair, chair of the IBA ICLE, and his team, including Sarah Ajujola, who, who, who with very little, very little have achieved so much um, uh, with uh, not too many boots on the ground, but have achieved phenomenal success in reawakening in the legal profession in Nigeria, the need for continuing legal education and continuing professional development. Uh, I'm proud that at our recent uh, webinars, we have uh, recorded such a high turnout of our members. Uh, recently at the criminal and the civil litigation training, we had as many as 10,000 uh, 10, of our uh, members log in and receive training. Um, and, and, and for the IP training, we had well over close to, well over 5,000. We have so many, we have resources available now on YouTube uh, for our members to go back to all of these trainings are recorded. Our members can go back to them and, and uh, in, in the event that they missed the trainings or in the event that they want to remind themselves of what was discussed, they are able to go and access this uh, material. For me, it is indicative uh, of, of a profession that has been reawakened uh, to the need for, to continue to train itself because we are knowledge merchants. And all we do really is uh, we sell knowledge. We, we, uh, we, we push the uh, frontiers of knowledge and, uh, and to those who need to hear from us as they undertake um, their various endeavors in life. So Tobena, uh, thank you very much. I'm extremely proud. I, I'm sure I'm entitled to some bragging rights because uh, there's no doubt that under my presidency, this uh, fire was not lit, but it was uh, reignited. And uh, we, have, uh, we have an institute that is up and running. But I know, I recognize that were it not for your, your determination and your doggedness, doggedness and that of your team, the light could very easily have gone out uh, very quickly. But we have the embers, uh, we have the lights still blazing and we're very grateful to you and your team. Um, I'm, I must also um, thank our friends, our colleagues from Allen and Overy, um, William Samengo Turner and, uh, and uh, Alex Chandro of the London office of Allen and Overy. We're extremely grateful to you for, for joining us and for um, allowing us to uh, uh, share or at least be beneficiaries of your, your, your expertise in this area. Uh, over the years, Allen and Overy has demonstrated its commitment to uh, capacity building on the continent. I am not, uh, I am not uh, unfamiliar with, with your firm. A uh, couple of my partners only just returned from your uh, the seminar that is you hold every year for your part, your Africa partners in London, and I know that there is a commitment at the highest levels of your firm to building capacity on the continent, while you continue to partner with us uh, Nigerian law firms working on the continent. And we're extremely grateful to you that you have continued to stay with us uh, on this on this journey. Thank you, William, and thank you, uh, Alex. Um, we are talking today about the challenges and opportunities of structuring for tech innovation. Um, no time more important than this. Technology has come to stay. The innovations in technology continue to redefine our spaces. And um, the whole essence of this particular training is to find out, is to try to prepare us to advise better our clients who are in the tech space. And every day we see that there are so many so many uh, developments in the tech space, and it is important that we stay on top of developments in the law that regulates that particular sector. And so tech law, uh, technology, and its many spin-offs, uh, the, uh, not the least of which is artificial intelligence and, uh, and, and, and all of the new things that have uh, become our daily reality. Uh, there's no way uh, we can be said to be, um, uh, doing well as, as lawyers if we are not on top of these developments and if we are not on top of uh, the laws that regulate these spaces so that we can uh, optimally advise or give uh, high-level advice, cutting-edge advice to our clients. So 
uh, Tobela, thank you to you and your team. And um, thank you to our, uh, our friends from Alan and Overy for picking this topic. Uh, and I see that our numbers are increasing. The participants, our people are extremely, extremely interested in what uh, we're going to be talking about today. I know that most of which, most of what we're talking about could be put in the box of tech law, tech law uh, technology law. But let us not forget also that as practitioners, we must embrace law tech. We must also uh, preach the gospel that, uh, 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 that uh, uh, we must also practice the gospel that we preach. We must also embrace technology as practitioners. So I'm hoping that somewhere today as we speak about tech law, tech in m and tech in, all, uh, in, uh, in finance, we would also remind ourselves that for us to be optimal, for us to provide a cutting edge service, we ourselves must also be seen to have embraced technology in the practice of our profession from the software that we deploy in accounting, from the software that we deploy in, in reviewing documents, understanding that uh, we can only be as, uh, we can only be considered to be um, excellent if we are nimble, if we're efficient. And that is what technology does in every sphere, including legal practice. So with those uh, few words, I want to again reiterate my gratitude. I will stay on as long as I can because I am a keenly interested in uh, what it is that we will be talking about today. So again, uh, uh, thank you guys. And, uh, and uh, thank you to all our, the members of the association who in their numbers have registered. Last time I checked, uh, well over 4,000, I think people have, are, are ready to uh, joining us today. Um, and um, without them, we'll just have an empty hall to, to talk to. So we're extremely, extremely delighted uh, that you are here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, I had earlier acknowledged our partnership with the NLNG Learning Academy. I am happy to note that we have uh, Sele Inibedion here and Lois Oni from NLNG. And um, when we finish with the presentation, after question time, I'll expect that uh, Sele or Akam Mukedi, if he's here, would make some closing remarks. So um, I think it's now time to yield the floor to, to, to Wills and Alex. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. President for those kind words, and thank you for having us. It's quite daunting being um, here with some, I'm looking at the numbers creep up, some 600 members of the association. Um, as as uh, previewed, ANO, our firm, has a long and storied history of working um, within um, within Nigeria on some fantastic deals. It's one of the most exciting jurisdictions in, uh, you know, in, in the region as far as we're concerned. And it's a real honor to be here to talk with you today. We have um, a, a good deck of, of stuff to get through. Um, as in time-honored uh, Zoom protocol, we're just gonna do a mic check to make sure you can hear both of us. Alex, can you, uh, can you, can you, can you speak and can you be heard? Hi everyone, very happy to be here. Excellent. Well, now I'm going to share, I'm going to put the uh, slides up on the screen um, and we will get on with the show. So uh, let's just do this. There, now hopefully um, everyone can, Alex, can you just give me a nod that you can see that? Excellent. So what are we talking about today? Um, uh, as, as previewed, it's, it's all about um, the challenge that is put to us as lawyers when businesses and clients of various shades uh, and shapes decide to engage with digital disruption in all its forms. We at ANO see that as three clear categories of, of response to that, to buy, to build, or to collaborate. And we'll go through each of those in turn, but at, at a high level, buy, to buy, we'll be looking at M&A and taking stakes in companies, to build, to kind of develop your own products internally and to kind of grow organically and kind of with your own R&D and to collaborate, to come together because different people have different skills and different ways of doing things. Um, over that spectrum, there are lots of different legal forms and what we find with clients in this space and what we find the challenge and part of the kind of excitement for um, lawyers like Alex and me is the um, ability to kind of play with lots of different structures to kind of be as, as innovative and um, creative as you possibly can be as you come through it. Now, um, I'm going to meet, be the one moving the slides here along. You do not need to see, there's a so our, our contact details should you have any questions 
or indeed complaints after the session, <laughs> you're more than welcome to get in touch with us personally. But um, look, one of the key things that runs through the entire thread of what we're going to be talking about uh, is, is IP. Um, just to kind of contextualize Alex and myself, I am the uh, M&A cowboy, uh, the equity guy who does the buying and the selling of companies, investments and venture capital and um, everything from Series A all the way through to very, very significant multi-billion dollar transactions. And Alex is the IP whiz who looks at the, the transactional IP side of stuff, along with data, trade secrets, copyrights, and patents, and everything that goes with it. That kind of combination, uh, at least Alex and I like to think, is what's essential to any good tech transactions deal, any, any deal that involves technology in this space. You need you know, the skills that both Alex and I bring to the table. And that's, what, that's again, the, the, the thread that runs through our session. So without further ado, let's get into the first of our themes, buy, or uh, you know, the one closest to my heart, M&A. Now, you know, acquisitions um, in tech are, in some ways, this is kind of the easiest one for us to kind of get our arms around right at the beginning of our session. It is just classic M&A. If you see something that you like or you haven't got in your own um, portfolio, you can buy the asset and bring it within your own group. Um, the pros and cons of this are obvious to anyone that practices M&A. You get control over the innovation. You um, have to Get, get the kind of a, you, you get you get a full understanding of what you're buying um and you 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 have day one control so that and that that kind of ability to go into a transaction and say right i know that once i own this and once i've integrated it if i couldn't do online payments before i'm going to buy this online payments business and that will be part of my part of my company now the cons are everything that comes with M&A. There's diligence to be done. It's complex. You might not like the thing you've bought once you've bought it. It might be difficult to integrate. It might come with all kinds of difficulties within it. And also, when it comes to technology, it could be a wholly new thing that your business is unfamiliar with. There's a concept that we sometimes refer to um, with some of our clients in Silicon Valley um, as this kind of certain old school businesses dancing like dad at the wedding, like trying to be cool by buying a tech company and then it not really working terribly well. So there's a bit, a piece here of understanding the culture of these companies. And that's a, a really tough thing to kind of get your hands around straight, first of all. So what makes tech acquisitions, tech M&A unique? Well, there are a few things that um, on top of the kind of classic things you would consider when it comes to tech M&A that you would want to bear in mind. The next two slides kind of talk to those. You know, the key points in tech M&A um, are, are kind of are, are stuff that some of it's quite obvious, some of it's a little bit more nuanced. And this is a slightly busy slide here, but hopefully is a useful one to cut out and take away should you be considering this with your clients or colleagues or businesses. Um, structuring in terms of tech M&A, overwhelmingly structured to share sales. Companies tend to be bought rather than asset sales. Very difficult to unpick assets in tech because there's lots of different bits that might make it work, lots of different IP. So you tend to package stuff up as a business it's a, um, a, a, as a share sale. But you know the important thing is often these businesses are led by individual founders who can be a bit erratic or can be kind of, you know, if you think about the Elon Musk's of this world, buying a business from Elon Musk is famously quite tricky. Um, so you're dealing with a structure, structuring with a, a, a new kind of counterparty. So understanding the dynamics and the uniquely personal dynamics that come with buying a company from an individual that's created it from startup often is a really important um, factor. Um, there's also the due diligence challenges that come with buying a fast growth tech company. Most of the tech companies that you might encounter or that might be for sale are relatively young companies. They're probably not, they, they, they've probably come developed quite quickly over the last five to 10 years, maybe less, and may not have all of the things that you'd normally expect of a more mature business, like a, a fully thought out employment policy or, or, or very, very kind of well-designed incentivization arrangements or having all of their tax returns up to date. A lot of this stuff has been done by individuals who are more focused on the product than the legal aspect of the business. So thinking about how you get diligence done quickly in a business that might not be able to help you understand itself 
is actually a real challenge. How do you make sure? And you, how do you make sure what the, you get you cover off the key things? And in diligence for companies like this, your key topics that you're going to be looking at, and we could do a whole session just on diligence of tech companies, but I won't bore you with that. Um, but and you'll see this as we go through that the key things are the IP. The employment position, so do the people who create the IP actually work in the business? The regulatory position of the business, if it's a, you know, if it's a fintech, does it have the licenses it needs? And then the corporate position of the building of the, of the company, like are the shares owned by the people who are supposed to own them? And are there crazy warrants or convertible loan notes or whatever else might be out there that you have to think about? That's kind of what you're going to be focusing on in diligence. Um, other points to bear in mind here, uh, the fact that um, we touched on the buyer and seller types it tends to be sellers who are founder based buyers. We're starting to see more private equity in the market. We're starting to see um, Silicon Valley en uh, enterprises come into the market and buy things outside America. Europe is selling up a lot of tech at the moment. We expect there to be more in Africa. There obviously Stripe has been investing in Nigeria, as has Visa. Um, we worked on various deals for people like Google in West Africa. So it, that is happening, uh, but it's still, that's, that's a slow growth, I think. Um, but, you know, the, 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 we will we will see more and more people come into the market, which will compl complicate the kind of the, the deal flow. Um, and then the, the, but the, as that happens, we see, you know, the, the, the one thing that does unite a lot of the buyers is a strong U.S. bias. And that means that you're going to be thinking about U.S. deal terms a lot. Again, there's a whole separate section and we'd be we'd love to come back and talk to you about U.S. versus European M&A. Um, but bearing, but that, that's 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 a whole hour in and of, of itself. But for today, the thing to bear in mind is a lot of the acquirers will be expecting a New York style acquisition agreement with lots of indemnities in it and specific disclosures and everything that goes with that. So thinking about that and thinking about how you might prepare for that is important. Final part of this slide are consideration structures in in uh, in in tech deals. Often there's an earnout. That earnouts became unfashionable for a while, but in tech, earnouts are quite often uh, are quite often included. Why do you have that? Often because it's difficult to ascribe a value to that business because one the founder will say, "I'm worth billions." I'm a unicorn. I'm worth billions of dollars, and the buyer will say, "Well, no, maybe not." So you earn out that over a period of time. Um, and we're seeing, you know, people use equity to purchase companies and, and various other aspects of the business kind of get, getting involved in the, in the valuation as, aspects of, of, of the deal. But earnouts are popular and deferred considerations popular, too. So that, that we that, that it's rare, not rare, but it's less common in tech deals to have all of the consideration paid at close. Quick one on this. Again, this is more of a cut out and keep to take away, but just a, 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 a summary of what you might see in a tech M&A again in terms of conditions, warranties and restrictions. If you were to summarize this whole slide, I think you'd just say it looks very American. There's a lot of conditionality, typically, because uh, that's what American um, deals tend to have. The warranties tend to be longer, but more focused, as we said, on IP, employment, data privacy, regulatory, um, and there tends to be more in the way of protective covenants there um, in terms of keeping people in the business for a longer period of time. The unique thing then, the unique kind of pain, painful thing in a tech deal is often that the cap table, so the share ownership table, is quite complex because a lot of these companies will have grown up quickly with lots of warrants in place or convertible loan notes and things of that nature. And so understanding the cap table at an early stage is really important. If you have a term sheet or you're looking at a business, you're thinking of selling or you're involved in an M&A of the, any kind of nature, getting the cap table up and up in front of you very quickly is very important. But that's kind of an overview of tech M&A um, and, and what we would expect to see in a deal. Now I'll switch to kind of how the IP and the kind of the, 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 more, the more technical elements of the deal in an M&A context go. Alex, I hand to you. Thanks, Will. So, as Will says, so I, I specialize in IP and technology transactions. So I work very closely with Will and others on M&A deals, uh, not just tech M&A deals, so M&A involving the acquisition of tech businesses, but technology is now sort of central to almost any M&A deal. Every modern business has data and technology. And like um, any, sort of M&A transaction where you are buying a business or uh, whether that's as an asset or as a as shares 
you need to be watching out for risks that you are acquiring. And on the IP side, there are some specific sort of practical watch outs I just want to flag now. Appreciating that IP rights are national rights. So the issues that arise in acquisitions that relate to Nigeria will be relevant, will be primarily specific to Nigerian law. But I understand that broadly speaking, in terms of IP rights, the ones that exist in Nigeria are similar to those sort of in, in, in Europe, in the UK, in the US. Um, and so just really practically, so not getting too much into the technical detail, I want to say a couple of things about patents and then a couple of things about software. So that those are the two sort of technology related IP assets that are most likely to be relevant in an M&A deal. Um, so firstly, patents. So like all IP rights, patents are so-called negative rights. So they don't give you the right to do something, they give you the right to stop others doing something. So you don't need a patent to use an invention. But what patents do do is that in relation to how you've described your invention in the patent claim, you can stop anyone else practicing or doing something within that scope. And that protection lasts for a fixed period of time and needs to be publicly disclosed. So you have to disclose your invention in order to benefit from the protection. So as with any other asset, when we are looking at potential patent issues in an M&A deal, we look at sort of three types of issue. Issues relating to ownership, issues relating to licensing, and issues relating to infringement. So a business might be in licensing inventions or from, from someone else, or it might be licensing out its inventions to someone else. That's, that's your licensing bucket. And I won't talk too much about those because those are contracts. So you treat them in broadly the same way that you would for other types of contract. You're looking at things like change of control provisions and termination rights and onerous payments and indemnities and, and those sorts of things. On ownership, as far as patents go, if you are looking at acquiring a, a business that has some sort of technology, you are looking for evidence that that business has a good handle on its patent registration strategy. So as I said, you don't have to get a patent to use your invention. In fact, many people choose not to because to get a patent, you normally have to disclose details of how your invention works. So you're making those details public in order to benefit from that sort of monopoly right. So many people choose to keep those details to themselves as a trade secret, we'll, we'll come on to that, and not to file a patent. So you're looking for what have they filed and have they correctly sort of defined the scope of the claim for the patent? And do, though, do, do the way that those sort of patents, have, has, does the way that those patent claims have been constructed, does that sort of indicate that they have a really good handle on their invention and on what they do? Um, by far the most sort of problematic or potentially problematic area with patents relates to infringement. And that's because when you describe how your invention works, that's as much an art as it is a science. And often patent claims run to 20, 30 pages and they have to describe it in enough detail for a layman like you, you and me to understand what the invention actually is. And if that doesn't meet the necessary test, it's open to challenge by a third party. And of course you've made your invention public. So a third party, to the extent is to the extent a third party claim is successful, those details are out there. So the validity of your patent can never really be guaranteed until the point, ultimately, someone challenges it, it goes to court, your claim gets heard and it goes up to the Supreme Court and the final course of appeal. That's the only point at which you can really say I have a valid patent when all avenues of challenge have been exhausted. So in an M&A deal, when someone says, can you warrant that your patents are valid? Well, actually the answer to that is probably not. So just something to watch out for. You're very unlikely to get comfort in your sale documents that you have valid patents. So that then puts the onus on the buyer to make sure they've done their own proper investigations and searches, so-called freedom to operate searches, which can be incredibly costly and time consuming to 
try to understand if there is something else out there in sort of existing patent filings or elsewhere that might mean that somebody else has come up with an invention that falls within the scope of your patent claim before the patent claim was filed. That's, that's called prior art. So it, I mentioned it because it's a, it's a classic sort of risk allocation question on a tech M&A deal. The seller is very unlikely to take the risk that they have valid patents, so then that becomes a buyer risk and something that the buyer has to spend money on to, to investigate and get comfortable on. So if we move on to software will. Um, so, so software is, is relevant to tech M&A because um, from an IP perspective, it's protected by copyright by and large. So software being a sort of series of ones and zeros that constitute a literary work, it's, it's effectively a copyright work. Um, usually in most jurisdictions, and I, I believe it's true in Nigeria as well, copyright is an unregistered right. So all the more problematic to diligence. So how do you get comfortable that copyright in software is properly owned by the business you're acquiring. Well, that involves looking at all of the contracts between the business and the people who developed the software, whether that's employees or third party contractors. You wanna make sure all the IP rights are funneling up into somewhere in the target business that you're acquiring. So that can be, you know, as Will says, if you're talking about relatively young businesses, which have been so primarily, created and operated by a small number of founders, this can be a real issue. If they haven't got the, the correct documents in place, they might have, you know, especially if they come from academic backgrounds, some of these founders might have developed sort of valuable works of authorship, including software, when they were also working as a lecturer at a university, or um, they might have done so when they were sort of by themselves in their bedrooms of coming up with this amazing new sort of app, and they haven't, got round to documenting the assignment of their own rights to their businesses, their companies. Um, so something that you need to watch out for is just where has the ownership of unregistered IP been funneled to? Um, I won't talk about licenses. I think we need to sort of skip over if that's okay, Will. And just, just one other thing I wanted to mention on software was open source. Um, this is a potential sort of high risk area. And the reason for that is a lot of software will have some components in it of open source software code. And open source basically refers to software that has been made publicly and freely available to the community, to the public at large, under the terms of licenses that are incredibly permissive. And the, you know, this started back in the 70s when a, a number of individuals thought that it wasn't right for some big corporations to have all the rights in sort of software that is basically essential to basic sort of building blocks for sort of other software applications. And the open source community over decades have splintered into all these different groups that released their software under different open source license terms. And as a result today, if you look at any sort of chunk of software code for an application or a platform, it is almost certain to include some open source software components. And the risk arises on an M&A deal to the extent that any of that open source software is licensed under what's written on the slide there as a restrictive license. And a restrictive license is one that has so-called copyleft terms in it. So you see what they've done there. So it's, it's the inverse of copyright. It basically means if you take a piece of this copyleft protected code and you use it yourself, you put it in one of your own products, perhaps, then your derived work, your own product, under the terms of your copyleft license, now need to be licensed back to the public to the open source community under the same open source license terms. And that is for obvious reasons, very problematic if you have created a sort of customer facing product, your frontline customer facing business, if you then have to make available to your competitors exactly how the code has been built. 
Um, so that's why it's important to understand when you're buying a tech business, the open source sort of community, you'd expect to see a, a very well maintained list of open source code used by the business and the license terms that correspond to each chunk of open source code. And this may well be, if, if, it, if it's a software business, if that's what it does, it distributes software to customers and it has some of this open source copyleft code within its code base, there's not necessarily anything that a buyer can do about that. You can't get an indemnity. You can't get comfortable with warranties. It's just something that needs to be fixed. And you need to understand, can that bit of open source code be taken out of the code base and replaced? How easy is that? How expensive is that? And it might end up being a deal breaker. So um, as I said, just a couple of practical um, points on IP uh, among a host of others, just to give you a flavor of the sorts of things that we look out for when, when working with the likes of Will. Yes, open source strikes terror to the heart of a M&A lawyer, we see it, so definitely a red flag if you see it. Um, just to round out uh, M&A, a quick one on aqua hires, which is a term um, you may be familiar with, but just in case we thought it'd be useful to cover off, because it's kind of, it's not, it's, you see it in life sciences as well, but it's, it's pretty, pretty germane or unique to tech. An aqua hire is a mixture, as it sounds like, of a hire, hiring of a team and an acquisition. Um, and it's it, it's essentially a deal whereby a big tech company, usually a, a meta or someone like that, comes along and says, I like this startup, but I only really like the people. I don't like the product. I don't like the, I don't need the IP. I just want to hire these people and put them on my platform. And so what you do is you kind of say, OK, here's a certain amount of money to pay off the shareholders. Um, I'm going to hire everyone and I want to sign a release document, essentially. Very short document, eight nine pages usually, saying, I hereby undertake never to sue you for hiring all of the company's employees. And I also undertake to shut down and go away and not to enforce any of my rights against you, acquirer, um, once you've hired all of those employees. So it's, it's kind of a useful way as, um, to hire a team in and to bring them in on, on a platform. Um, it is uh, a blunt instrument. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it's, as I say, short, short and sweet. Big tech loves doing it because they often just want the team, they want the brain power, and then it usually comes with some enticing visas to move to Menlo Park or to New York or wherever it might be. Um, but it is a um, it is an unusual structure, and it falls somewhere between employment law and M and A, but useful to have in your back pocket um, should it ever come up. Anyway, that is enough of buy. I'm conscious of time, so I want to keep moving on. We're on to now build um, or building your own products products internally. Now there are a number of ways of doing this, and we'll kind of run through the kind of pros and cons and how they um, how they work. Um, but you know, it's it's kind of the organic approach um, of doing things. First of all, we'll kind of turn to kind of you're just having your own R and D program. I think this is kind of you know the classic um, classic approach to to tech development. The great example of this, um, whether you say it's a great example or not, but the kind of classic example is the, the big banks of the world developing their own tech platforms before um, the likes of PayPal or Stripe or even a Visa kind of got their hands on it. Um, and th th they essentially just hired in their own tech team to build systems that could could, could uh, innovate, um, including making ATMs work or making sure that the CHAPS payment system was properly resourced and, and, and locked. It is, however, um, you know, it, 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 as with all these things, if you wanted to build a tech company, you probably wouldn't start in a bank, uh, for example, or indeed any legacy industry that is yet to be digitized. So it's 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 usually a difficult way and a quite inefficient way of 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 developing a tech product, unless you are yourself a tech company. And so what's interesting now is we're seeing the likes of Google and PayPal and eBay and people of, of that nature themselves being disrupted as new companies come in and then thinking, oh, well, I've got to now hire people maybe through an aqua hire or develop new product lines because I've seen, you know, we're, we're, we should in the coming months see Apple release a VR headset. The only reason they're doing that is because they got disrupted by Meta who released the Oculus and, you know, everything that goes with it. And, and Meta got excited by the Google Glass, which was a complete failure. So you have this kind of mixture of things that, that moves people along. Um, and then the, the 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 kind of slightly slower legacy business tries to catch up with the R and D. Now it's not to say all R and D is bad. It's absolutely not the case. Some of the best kind of innovations come from these R and D units, but they usually this is kind of one part 
of a wider toolkit. And it can um, sometimes it can sometimes be really, really good. But if, if you were advising a client, you're talking internally about structures within your own businesses. I think the approach we normally recommend is like, yes, there should be a central R&D function that helps coordinate some acquisitions, some investments, some internal projects. But ultimately doing it all alone, unless you really happen to be, you know, you have a really interesting team that can do it um, is is challenging. One of the ways that you um, that you see this this kind of being uh, the companies kind of approaching um, this is to um, kind of almost do the R and D externally through incubators and accelerators. Now, almost every company worth its salt has some sort of incubator or accelerator. ANO has one. It's called Fuse. Um, we're on cohort nine, and it's a very good way. We talked about legal tech um, um, at the top of the call. That is our searchlight for new legal tech, and we've had the first blockchain um, powered uh, SMB bond. We've had uh, uh, companies that kind of work out how to check for defined terms without having to spend all night doing it. We've had companies that have give grant access to refugees as they um, get legal advice through immigration services, lots of different forms of legal tech in there. Um, and it's a, it's a great way for us to innovate internally and to, to develop our own tech platform, because we can look at these startups, they can either inspire us or work with us um, or collaborate with us, and we'll come to collaborate in a minute. Um, and it's it, it, you know it's it's an important an important part of of a toolkit. I think it's kind of almost an, assen a, an essential for any business that's facing disruption. Often, what we get asked about is kind of what's the difference between an incubator, an accelerator, a tech hub, all of these things. That that, that, that there's no kind of clear line between each of these things. There's sort of certain certain traits with certain certain forms. An incubator is probably more permanent. Uh, it's a thing that sits there as part of the business. It incubates technology on a regular basis with people coming and going. An accelerator tends to be more programmatic, so it might have a specific uh, mission that it's trying to achieve, trying to get through, um, and try to kind of get to get to a certain product launch. So often, if you look at the big accountancy firms, like EY has a great accelerator that often focuses on particular problems. Says, right, for the next six weeks or the next four months, this is the problem. The members of the accelerator are going to try and uh, fix this issue. Either way, it's a really interesting, uh, interesting way of doing things, and, and again, can can raise the, the 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 level of innovation. The business can inspire employees, but also give you access to really interesting new um, ways of doing things. It can, however, take time to gather momentum and credibility. Um, you'd have limited control over the assets that are developed by that incubator or accelerator, usually on the terms. I mean, there's no there's no law here that specifically says one thing or the other. It's contractual, so usually the innovation will stay with it, the people who who create it, unless you agree otherwise. Um, and then the startups within your incubator may well sell out, or may, you may well may well want to sell out to other competitors because they don't want to be tied to just one brand. If you look at, um, say, like a J Labs, the Johnson & Johnson incubator, one of the largest in the world, they're very open about the fact they want the members of the incubator to go out and work with other members of the of the uh, of the ecosystem, um, so it's it's um, it's it's an interesting thing where you have to get, kind of almost be a little bit selfless by developing companies that will disrupt the whole market. And and finally, it can be a little bit difficult to differentiate. As I said, everyone has an incubator. We personally think our incubator is the best in the market. I happen to know it is, but I'm sure if you spoke to another law firm, they would suggest that there were others that would give us a, a run for our money. It is a part, but it is a, an important part of the developmental ecosystem. Anyway, on to you know, the importance of data in that innovation. Um, Alex, back to you. Thanks, Will. So to, just, just to, without wanting to state the obvious, so, so data will be fundamental to any innovation program. So whichever route you go down, if you are building your own innovation functionality within your business, you will need data. Uh, so Data has huge value for modern businesses, both as an asset in its own right, and as an enabler for other technologies like uh, AI, which, which was already mentioned at the top of the call. And the reason for flagging it specifically here is because there are certain features or characteristics of data that make it, as well as being incredibly important, also quite um, that sort of raises some complexities to work through. Um, and they, these are sort of fairly crudely put up on this slide here. So firstly, data is almost limitless. 
there is a lot of it. Um, it can take many different forms. It can be generated manually by humans or by machines in, in different formats and uh, all, all sorts of different file structures. Um, there can be lots of people involved in creating it. There can be um, very few people involved in creating lots of it. And how the data is generated, the format in which it is generated and stored, is all relevant to determining how useful it is and how risky it is to use. And more than any of those points is the one at the bottom right of that slide. Um, there is no legal concept of ownership of data in itself. Um, we did have a slide at the beginning that we sort of skipped over a little bit, sort of introducing some of these sort of key IP rights that protect uh, sort of technology and innovations. There was no there was no box on that slide for data. So there are there are rights that will be relevant. So if, if data is sort of written down in some sort of literary form, the form will be protected by copyright. There are certain rights, and I believe also in in Nigeria, that protect databases so not the content of a database but how data has been arranged and structured to the extent that investment has been made in, in structuring it that way and then of course to the extent data informs a patent it might also be protected uh, within the scope of that patent claim which leaves you with confidential information and trade secrets as really your only route of protecting data itself and trade secrets uh, fundamentally, and then there's sort of slightly sort of different regimes around the world, including in Nigeria, but broadly speaking, the idea of a trade secret is that it protects information that has a certain quality of confidence. So that is ultimately an evidential question. What steps have been taken to maintain the confidentiality of the information, of the data? That, that is what you're relying on with data. So just have that in mind as we go through these next few slides. So if we if we skip on, um, Will, so the one thing that businesses that are looking to innovate will naturally turn to, probably as one of the very first objectives, is we have all of this data. How can we monetize it? How do we innovate using this data? And that will obviously depend very much on what the data is. And so the first step is always to do an audit of that data. And what we sort of show in this slide is, is the, sort of the sequence of events that sort of starting from that audit to all of the considerations that you'd need to give to end up with a strategy for monetizing your data. I won't go through all of those steps. As Will said, this is one that you can sort of look at and reflect on after this. But there'll be a combination of legal and commercial issues around your data. Um, oh, Will, you, you've... Uh, Sorry, ahead a little bit. Yeah. Skip right to the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what happens when I talk about data. Yeah. Sub subliminal messaging to yeah. Alex here. Um, there we were here. Um, so, so back on. So, so look on the commercial side. There will be um, on, on the commercial side. One of the the main issues you need to think about with 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 data is antitrust. And combining big data sets with other big data sets can raise antitrust issues. And there have been all sorts of examples in the news. Um, Facebook WhatsApp was one that caught lots of headlines. Um, basically, the idea is if a big tech company acquires access to a big data set, combines it with their own, does that sort of overall consolidated data set give them sort of market dominance? Is that a barrier to competition? Um, that, that's obviously an extreme case, but we are looking at antitrust authorities more and more sort of active in this area around how data is monetized specifically and that's driving all sorts of industry trends um, uh, around sort of data licensing so if, if we if we move on to the next slide if your business if your client is looking at innovating using their data they will be looking at doing one of two things and probably a combination actually not only will they be looking to exploit their own data by licensing it out, they will also be getting data from others and combining it with their own because that will probably make their own data more valuable. So whichever direction you're looking at this, both in and out, there are some specific considerations for your data license terms. Um, I won't talk about all of these, but 
just, just to pick out a few from this list. Obviously, firstly, you need to be clear what is being licensed. And that will probably depend who you're acting for, but also on what exactly the overall objectives are of the license. And you can either go very narrow, so specific to a very particular database that you have accurately sort of captured or described, or generically, something like any data useful for a particular project or arrangement. And there'll be all sorts of commercial questions and factors around which of those approaches is most appropriate. Um, but what we'll sort of come on to look at is sort of why that's important. So usage rights. So as well as what you're licensing, what can you use the data for? So is it a specific project or is it something more broad? And I'm just going to mention AI again, and I'm going to pick up on it later too, because a huge part of my practice now is it sort of relates to AI, whether that's sort of transactions that are focused on sort of accessing AI or, or sort of strategic advice on, on how to protect AI and the outputs of AI. But as, and, and I think the same issues apply to sort of licensing tech more broadly, but it obviously AI and to an extent other technologies too, like um, big data and cloud computing platforms, um, to the extent they depend on access to data, the usage rights in your data license terms are critical. And that's because data will probably, for the particular product that's being licensed or being built as part of this sort of R&D function, data will probably make the performance of that product better. So naturally, if you are the one in licensing the data, you want more and more of it and you want really broad usage rights. You want to be able to use it to improve your products and services, both for your for yourself, but also for your customers. And you look at it from the other perspective, if you're licensing tech, if you're licensing data to someone else, the same will be true for them. If the entity involved in licensing the data does have AI models, and if we take it as read that more data means better AI models, then the AI company will want the ability to use your data to improve their models generally, so for everyone's benefit. And that's the quid pro quo for them of being able to make their technology available to you. And they will say, yes, we need your data. We're going to make our AI amazing and even better so you can benefit from it, but also our customers need to as well. Um, now, that's, that's a development we've seen that's been really accelerated by these AI contracts. But it used to be a topic that came up just in a sort of average tech service agreement. What rights does the tech provider have to use your materials and data beyond the specific project? Classic negotiation issue. But because of AI, because these technologies are so data hungry, it's no longer really a point for negotiation. It's something that you, you simply have to accept. And the question is where along the spectrum you get to. Um, and it's, it's you sort of naturally, if you're a big, big corporate, if you're, as Will says, if you're, in the, if you're a traditional entity that isn't, that you're trying to innovate, you're not used to that sort of mindset. You would probably philosophically want to be guarding your data and your proprietary materials as much as possible. So you have to get comfortable with letting your tech provider use your materials more broadly. Um, and you'd want to think about how you can put in place the right safeguards to stop them sharing your information with competitors, um, among other things. But that, that's a sort of natural tension with these sorts of arrangements where data is involved and something to watch out for and, and really comes to the fore because, as I said, there is no form of protection for data in itself. So it all comes down to how you set out your controls in the contract. And one final point to pick up is number, um, where did I put it, number four, um, which is really, I, I call it derived data, is, is mainly about improvements, actually. So if you're acting for a client that's in licensing data as part of their own sort of tech or digital product offering, one thing you need to watch out for is that your data license terms don't allow the original licensor to claim ownership of your client's technology as an improvement over their data. So you want to look for how they've defined improvement and what happens to improvements because your client will be using the data to create something and that will be something independent of the original data 
So you don't want there to be an ability for the original licensor to reach across and say that they somehow own your client's innovation. Um, if we move on, that, that was just a, a, few, a few words about data. Um, in the interest of time, I think I might skip over this slide actually, Will, and keen to sort of get into sort of more general issues on in-licensing technology. Um, I think if you are building your sort of your own R&D function, obviously the idea is that you'll do that using your own resources, but you will always need access to third-party tech and third-party data to do that. And there's different ways you can do it. One of them is to license in third-party technology on a sort of SaaS basis of software as a service. So you, you don't actually get the underlying code that the third party has developed, but you have the ability to access and use it. Um, so you might hear them called SaaS agreements or um, software license agreements, but it isn't really a license because you're not getting a copy of the code. So you don't really need IP rights. You don't need an IP license to use it. Um, these on the slide here, are some of the sort of business considerations around in licensing third party technology. And I won't mention all of these, but the general message here is that in terms of a risk management perspective, so in terms of the, the lawyer's role in an organization in licensing tech, it all starts with your use case. And there will be certain technologies that raise certain risks. And we're going to talk a little bit about AI in a few minutes. Um, but for any tech, any organization's sort of standard sort of information security requirements and onboarding processes will need to be applied specifically to the use case for the tech. So you need to understand what IP rights are relevant to the product you're in licensing. Does it use data in a certain way? Has it been built using personal data? Was that done lawfully? Does it require you to use your own personal data to operate it? Um, there's, there's a host of questions. And, and I, I guess the message here for, for, for lawyers, for external counsel in particular, is to ensure that your client is involving legal and IP and compliance and data teams at this phase of the process, at this of the use case process, at the use case phase. Um, and then you sort of can follow the, the thread along the slide there for some of the, the, the questions that you'd want to be involved in considering. And then if we apply this wheel to the next, if we move on to the next a couple of slides, what we're going to do quickly, I thought it'd be quite fun and very topical to take as a sort of a case study for this, a business that is in licensing an AI solution. It's a nicer way of illustrating the legal risks and how lawyers can be involved in, in reducing those. Um, just a minute or two on what I mean by AI. It's um, obviously been all over the, the, the press recently, making headlines around the world. Um, I think it's quite useful to remember that what we really mean by AI is simply a mathematical equation implemented in software and written by a person. And that, in its purest sense, has been around for probably more than 70 years. And businesses, including in Nigeria and around the world, would have been using AI for a very long time. Um, what has changed, and I'd say sort of 20, 25 years ago, we sort of moved down into the dark gray circle in your slide there, so machine learning. So what, what AI used to be about was sort of human programmers listing specific rules that a program would have to follow to answer a particular question. What we now mean by AI is machine learning. So it's actually giving a machine um, an objective and enabling it to emulate the way that humans think. So they learn over time through input to data how to predict an answer to that objective, how to reach the objective. Um, so machine learning and AI today are pretty much used interchangeably. Uh, but that's 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 what we mean. So it's a mathematical model trained on data to predict a solution to a problem. 
And there's many different forms that AI can take if we if we skip on Will. I'm, I'm not going to talk about how each of these works. There's a, there's a list of some of the sort of different types of machine learning on this slide. I'm not going to talk about each of them. They each use data in different ways. They each involve different levels of human input. What I am going to mention is, is the note at the bottom of that slide, which refers to generative AI, simply because that's that's been that's that's the buzzword that's been making the news in the last sort of eight, nine months or so since chat GPT became part of our sort of popular culture. Um, so generative AI is it's just another label. So it's not a it's not a specific type of technology, it's just a label given to a machine learning system or combination of many machine learning systems that can generate a human like output, whether that's text or images or video or anything else, speech, um, all sorts of things, um, based on a human input. And this all revolves around the ability to understand language. I say understand, obviously, it's, it's not really understanding it, but the these mathematical models have been given an ability to contextualize words and language, which is an incredibly powerful thing because now machines can act upon almost any instruction that humans may give it. Now, it is still a prediction, going back to what I said before, it's not going to be a guarantee of accuracy. Um, but it is the use cases for generative AI are almost endless. Any any workplace scenario you can think of, you can imagine a role for generative AI. Um, and going back to sort of legal tech, you know, A, a and O, we, we ourselves have been one of the very first and very few companies to adopt generative AI globally throughout our law firm. We have a version of GPT-4, so this is OpenAI's um, generative AI model, the same one that powers ChatGPT, which has been trained on legal text. And we're, we're really lucky to have access to this. We're one of, I think, one of, if not the only law firm to have access currently. And it's fantastic. I use it almost every day. It, it, it's not groundbreaking, but it saves me time and probably over the course of a week, maybe an hour or two a week, in terms of helping me with research, structuring notes, memos, I can turn emails into PowerPoint presentations at the clip of a button. It's um, it's definitely, I don't think I'm pushing the boat out to say it's the future of working. And so we are also very heavily involved in advising clients on how to adopt generative AI safely, because we have that first-hand experience of doing it ourselves. And um, generative AI does raise a number of specific legal risks, which will, if you move on to the next slide, um, I just allude to, ah, sorry, before I allude to the risks, this, this, I'm not going to talk about this slide at all. It's a really scary picture that's meant to show you how complicated and vast the legal landscape is for AI. Um, it touches on so many different parts of a business and the, the, the regulatory regimes that apply to our clients. Uh, from data to cyber to IP to competition to human rights to employment. I mean, it's it's a huge list of relevant areas. So again, as a, as a lawyer counseling businesses adopting AI, a really key takeaway is it's a holistic approach that's needed. You need to engage stakeholders across all of these different areas right from the very beginning. Um, that's all I wanted to say on that slide. Um, otherwise, we, we would be here all day. Um, and then look, the key risks of generative AI. So they're largely driven by two of the features of, of the technology. One is that, as I mentioned, it is this huge sort of vast mathematical mixing of equations and data. And the people who developed the models, they're not even able to say how and why a particular output is generated. And there's a few different issues that arise from that. One is something called hallucination. So sometimes the output can just be wrong. Sometimes it can be inconsistent. You ask it the same question on two different days, the answer will be different. And um, it can be very hard to predict. All of which, if you imagine you apply that technology to a world where you're dealing with consumers, you know, as a, you know, as a consumer facing chatbot, for example, or you're generating software code that you put into your products that your customers use. Um, you can imagine that is a real risk legally if 
your consumers are getting inconsistent outcomes that could give rise to liability for tort, for um, regulatory breaches, uh, for product liability, for defamation. You know, there, there, there's a whole host, depending on what you're using it for, a whole host of potential liabilities there. And the other sort of key risk area is that it's taking human content and generating an output from it. And the way it generates an output is by being trained on a whole host of other human content. So that gives rise to these risks here. There might be a risk that you're using, in using the model, you're creating an output that uses someone else's IP without permission. IP infringement has been a big focus of the, the, sort of the coverage of these technologies. Likewise, data privacy. If you're using the model in a way that uses individuals data or data about individuals, it's really challenging. So this fundamental tension between how the technology works and respecting laws around personal data. And at the moment, those sort of risks, and I appreciate I've, I've just been very high level in describing them, those risks at the moment have no solution. There is no zero risk approach to this. There are a range of tools you can use to reduce those risks. And how you do that will depend almost entirely on what you're using the technology for. Um, and one approach will relate to the terms on which you license the technology. And I'm just going to take one as an example, and then I think we'll probably have to move on from this topic. But um, to take that IPR infringement risk as an example, if you move on to the next slide, Will. If you use AI to create output and the output that you've used the AI to create reproduces someone else's information that the AI company originally used to create the model, that person who owns those rights could potentially sue you for copyright infringement. Now, in a traditional software license, you would reach for your sort of IP infringement indemnity. You would say, this is how I get rid of that risk because I wasn't responsible for building the technology, so I shouldn't have to bear the risk. That is not going to work in an AI context because the way that these technologies have been created is sort of so widely known to revolve around accessing as much data as possible including sort of scraped off the internet without having the right to do it. No AI provider would give that indemnity to its customers. They'd, they'd go bankrupt in, an, in a week if they did that. So it's a business risk that the customer would have to take. And there are perhaps certain ways you could formulate an indemnity to get the provider comfortable. But ultimately what you're looking at is as a user of generative AI, what can I do to deal with this risk practically. So that means what can I do to stop people even noticing that I'm using AI? Even if there's an infringing copy that I've made, how do I modify it so that no one notices? How do I use it? Do I make sure no one outside my organization ever sees this? That, you know, can I get the AI provider to configure the way the AI works in a certain way to make sure that within the training data used to make the model, there's absolutely no ability for the model to, to, to churn out an output that sort of overlaps with a certain portion of the training data. There's, there's a host of, sort of technical and practical steps you can consider to get rid of this risk. But the takeaway is you're very unlikely to be able to sort of outsource the risk altogether under your contract. Um, I've probably talked enough about AI. I, I could keep going for a long time. Uh, I know it's a topic that lots of people are interested in. Um, but I'm keen that we leave enough time to talk about the, the, the third of our three sort of buckets, which is which is collaborate. So I might hand over to Will at this point and then happy to pick up questions on AI in, in the Q&A. Yeah, and I've been looking at the Q&A coming in. Um, you, 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 your, your piece in AI has spiked interest. So we'll try and leave uh, a, a few minutes at the end um, to talk about AI. But let's uh, canter through collaborate as quick as we can, because it certainly says it's self-explanatory, but it has a key important differences. It's essentially a fusion of what we've just been talking about, somewhere between um, buying the whole thing outright 
or developing the whole thing internally. It's a mixture of the two, either through joint ventures or investments or um, uh, or, or, or contractual joint ventures as well. So we'll, we'll, cut, we'll but we'll we'll get through it reasonably quickly and onto the questions because I see quite a few things coming through. So let's start off with um, joint ventures and collaborations um, between two two more points. I mean, so there's as broadly speaking, there's two forms of joint venture. This is not unique to technology, but just as a refresher, two forms of joint venture that you might try to um, to engage with. Uh, an equity-based joint venture, so you both own 50% of a company, for example, and you pour the assets in, and that company then creates profits and develops our, our, you know, IP, which you 50-50 or 40-60 or whatever it might be, share. And then in the end, you have exit provisions to sell it or to, or to channel the IP up or to make uh, take advantage of the products or to have a call over the share rights. I would say that is a uh, in 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 some ways a classic structure, one which we all know well. It's well documented. We've all done one. If you've worked in corporate law, you will have done something like that. But it is complex. Uh, there's a lot of things to think about. You're not unlike an acquisition where you're just legislating for the transaction on the day. You're legislating for what might be a three, five, ten year relationship. So it's a very different set of of things you need to think about. If you were to compare acquisitions to, to joint ventures at a very fundamental level, acquisitions are all about, the documentation is all about a, a sharing of risk. Who gets the risk on the asset? You know, who's, where are the warranties? Where are the indemnities? Who's going to pay for it? Whereas joint ventures are all about control. How much control am I going to have over this asset over the long term? How am I going to sell it? How am I going to get my stuff? How are you going to get yours? So it's a different way of negotiating. So and you, uh, before you get into it, you have to think about that and also think about the complexity that's associated with that. Um, in terms of contractual collaboration, a little simpler, arguably, because you're not investing in something. You can kind of terminate the contract. You can move away. You're not each holding equity in a thing which you then have to sell or, or dissolve. But similar issues abound you know, of, of, around you know, how are you going to get on with each other? How are you going to develop the product? How, what happens when you develop IP together? Uh, this is the point at which usually my IP colleagues say, don't say joint IP or things of that nature. So there's a, lots, of, lots of things where the corporate lawyer suddenly gets told to go to one side and, and the IP lawyers come in. But there's a lot of bear traps in um, contractual collaboration, just as there are in joint ventures. Very important to kind of think carefully. In all of these deals, obviously, a term sheet's important. When it comes to a joint venture and the complexity that comes with a joint venture, a term sheet's absolutely essential. I've bought and sold companies without any term sheet, and it's been totally fine. I have never done that with a joint venture. You really do need to kind of test the water with each other to see whether or not you're, if you're going to work as a couple. Next, um, you know, we've got this kind of just a summary of kind of the pros and cons of joint ventures and collaborations. Not going to spend time on that, just kind of goes into more depth as a cutout and keep. Um, and then the, the kind of uh, slightly different flavor of um, of, of collaboration is uh, an early stage, and we'll see late stage in a second, corporate venturing program. Now, what do I mean by corporate venture? I mean taking minority investments in disruptive businesses for the most part, or startups. Um, yeah, whereas a joint venture will often be 50-40 or 40-60, it'll, it'll be similar size or there are lots of people coming together with a kind of similar a similar mission. A joint, a, a, a corporate venture or VC investment is necessarily a smaller stake in a fast growth company where you do round after round after round. It's when we start getting into series A and series B and series C. Um, it's a classic way of fueling tech innovation because most of the businesses that get VC money are equity hungry, cash cash hungry. They they aren't profitable at, and they're often pre revenue, let alone pre profit. Oh, uh, and so they will um, be needing much more investment than you might otherwise expect. Um, the benefits of this, though, is you get in early, you get influence over a company, you get access to some of the most disruptive businesses in the country, um, and you get you know an amazing opportunity to to spread your bets over a wider a wider pool of companies. If you look at a um, a, a serial investor like a um, like a Meta, for example, that takes lots of little stakes in companies all over the world, or a BMW, which does the same when it comes to automated automotive innovation, lots of little little stakes all over the world. They can they have access through those investments to hundreds, if not thousands, of companies, which then in turn allows them to see the market and has 
a lead if that company becomes very, very important to them. So they might actually be in a better place to buy the whole company and bring it in to the acquisition. An example of how this buy, build, collaborate we've been talking about isn't just one thing. There's lots of tools here. You might start with some early corporate venturing and end with some M&A, or you might decide to enter into a, a contractual joint venture with something which also you own 5% of. Lots of different bits here. And that's what this whole presentation has been about, about giving you the beginnings of a toolkit to take it away and think about how you structure for innovation in your businesses and in your, your practices. But early stage corporate venturing is a very interesting and kind of more like the casino. In comparison to that, late stage strategic investment or corporate venturing is less of a casino, more of a, as I say, a strategic investment. By this point, the companies are really chunky. They might have valuations of 200, 300, a billion dollars. Once you get to a billion dollars, you're a unicorn. Once you get to $10 billion, you're a decacorn. The one I like I heard recently is if you're about 800 or $900 million in valuation, you are a sunicorn because you will soon be a unicorn. Um, it's tech. We make these things up as we go along. Um, but the important thing here is these are more significant, substantial investments in companies that have shown their worth shown their quality. And so you get um, people taking stakes in these for different reasons. They might actually be stake building because they see a competitor in the market and they want to try and acquire it in due course. Or they might be investing because they want to do a commercial collaboration. And the company has said, right, I need cash. I'll do an R&D project with you to help you disrupt your own business. But I'm going to need some equity investment from you at the same time. Again, cons on this in terms of the drawbacks, you know, it's, it's it, it, the later stage the company comes, come you come you come to, it, the harder it is to get those preferential terms that you get at the early stage. VC investors get great terms because they're the only game in town, whereas, you know, court, later stage investors have to essentially take the terms that, that previous investors have agreed to, so there's less room for manoeuvre. And, you know, look, these companies do still fail. You look at some of the uh, some of the companies are really big and they do end up going under. So it's not a surefire bet. And you are still a minority investor in these companies. You do not hold control. And so if the company is starting to struggle and you have a you have you own 20 percent of it or five percent or whatever the chunk might be in a very big company, that might be an uncomfortable place to be as part of an investment. So let's switch um, to finish off and I'm going to challenge Alex to do IP rights and JVs and collaborations in, in just under five minutes. Alex, take it away. You know what? I, I, I reckon I can do it in half of that because oh, all, wow. all, 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 all I think I need to say on this section um, and actually, this this is based on a, a, a talk I usually give in in an hour. But but basically, the that the key takeaway here is that IP rights are generally seen as critical to the success of a joint venture or a collaboration. And actually, there have been all sorts of polls done of directors on this, and they all rank IP related considerations as in three of the sort of the top five risks for doing a JV or a collaboration. Um, and IP rights will need to be considered at every stage of the life cycle of a joint venture or collaboration from the pre-contract sort of negotiation in terms of, you know, you're, you're feeling each other out, you're, you, you know, to, you need to work out if you're going to be a good partnership and what you can each bring to the table. You will want to sort of understand a bit more what IP rights each of you has. So sharing confidential information in that phase already, that's sort of number one forming the joint venture what ip rights will each party contribute on what terms operating it what happens to ip that the joint venture creates who owns it who has rights to use it do you own things jointly that's very complicated so what do you need to deal with that who is responsible for looking after the ip so prosecuting enforcing that kind of thing and then most critically and I think probably the reason why it can take a lot longer to negotiate a joint venture than an M&A deal. So you have to think through what will happen to your IP rights when the joint venture ends. Because so it's useful to think in a joint venture context that termination isn't really, it's a, bit, it's a bit of a misnomer. You're not really terminating because hopefully in your joint venture, you've created something valuable. And that thing that you've created will hopefully survive the joint venture. So then the IP rights that subsist in that thing that you've made or that are needed to operate it, you need to deal with after your joint venture has terminated. So that typically involves 
various sort of licenses from the joint venture parties and assignments of ownership to sort of put the rights in, in the place where you've agreed they need to be. Um, and it can be very difficult for commercial counterparties to think through how that will work at the beginning, at the outset of a joint venture. People don't like to think about what happens when things end or when they go wrong, but it's critical to the success of a joint venture that you do that. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say really on, on IP in this section. There, there's obviously more that I could get into, but, but keen, to, keen to get into the questions. There always is more. So that is, <laughs> that, that is, that is us um, at, at speed. Um, lots of topics here. Very happy to come back and do other sessions, but we have 10 minutes for questions. So um, to be now, hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Alec, Alex, and thanks, Will. Um, very brilliant presentations. We'll make our comments at the end. Um, but I'll quickly call on uh, Sele, if he's here, from uh, NLNG for any comments that he would have. Um, we're very grateful to the NLNG Learning Academy for helping us put this together. Um, Sele, are you there? Or do you want to come at the very end? Yeah, Tobin, no, it's, I'm here. I am here. Good afternoon okay. to you and afternoon all. But your preference depends on you. We'll, I could run our spill now at the very end. All right, go ahead. All right, thanks. And thank you, uh, Will and Alex. It's been extremely informative. It's a brand new space uh, for most of the people uh, listening here. And... I get the feeling we'll have demand to talk a bit more about this because it digs into what uh, we at Nigeria LNG Legal are doing. So NLNG is not just about gas. We have a very thriving legal and compliance function, which tries to drive our vision of helping to build a better Nigeria and legal space. And that's why we have the NLNG Legal Learning Academy, which in collaboration with the NBA and the NBA Institute of Continuing Legal Education is working together to deepen competency and capacity in emerging legal areas. And I think there are lots of them. We want to open up those conversations that our Nigerian lawyers don't typically turn their attention to and unlock value for that Nigerian legal talent. So there's a lot in the tech revolution space in Nigeria with startups, venture capital. The ideation in Nigeria is unbelievable and we need the lawyers here to channel that into value, create new opportunities for yourselves and play a leading role, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa. And I think that's what informs the choice of topics the NLLA has been putting together with the NBA. The opportunity and the value in this space is it's unbelievable it's uh, and i think uh, will and alex have just scratched the surface ip underlies this all and i think it came out a number of times when will spoke about the corporate lawyers stepping aside for the ip lawyers to drive those conversations that's the genre of lawyers we need to create here the value there it's not just in litigation it's unbelievable what we could do in this space, if we generate that interest and deep in that capacity, because we see a gap in the know-how available currently, and this is a big value opportunity where we can service not just Nigeria, but Africa. So I'm really impressed with what you've covered in terms of M&A, delving into IP ownership, licensing and infringement, then risk. Legal risk is something we're really focused on here in NLNG, and I, I like how you focused on those. It could be really expensive when it goes wrong, and enough uh, is not said about that. So we've I've looked into the questions, and I really will get off in a minute just to allow you do some justice to those. But I see questions coming about Acquihire, tech in legal, the incubators and accelerators you talk about, improvement, and the regulatory space. Someone used the word weak legal and regulatory space but i'll say yeah, we see it as opportunity and a lot of uh, the lawyers on this call will advise the organizations their clients and even the regulators in deepening that regulatory space we see the opportunities there so it's all about ai now it's all about data improvements generative ai right now i think that's a, that's a buzzword everywhere and we don't niger know the carry last that's the way the nigerians say it so we're really trying to tickle your interest, pick this up. We will be coming again with the NBA on this subject. And uh, there are a lot of other new things going on in the legal and uh, commercial space, which will unlock 
value in ways we've not thought of before. The changes in energy transition, the carbon reduction, CCUS, and we will leverage on our part as NLNG and the NLLA our relationships with class leading firms like Allen and Overy and the other ones we partner with in collaboration with the NBA and the Institute of Continuous Legal Education under Tobinna's leadership to bring these opportunities to us, deepen that competency and capacity and really, really unlock value for the Nigerian legal profession and our very, very significant talent now and into the near future. So it's really thanking Will and Alex again. This, I believe it's just a starter conversation. We've had, we have almost a thousand people at one point, 850, but it's counting. And I believe our rerun of this will, because you've got the juices glowing. I think that the conversation is flowing. The questions are showing that. And we thank you for the time you've made out of your very busy schedules to be here and talk about this. So thank you. And I think I, I it's really, unfortunately, our general counsel and legal and company secretary, Akam Okedi, who's really the driver of the NLLA, couldn't be here today, but he extends his warmest regards to our colleagues from Allen and Overy, to Tobin and the NBA team, and all our legal colleagues on this call today. Thank you very much, Tobin, and back to you. Thank you very much, Saleh, thank you. Um, so we'll just quickly take question time. And the first person is, uh, would it be okay? Yes, we'll distribute the slides. I think that's a question for me. Uh, the second is, please, what will be the position of requirements to practice law with regard to the newly robot lawyer trending to practice law, particularly in the USA? <laughs> well, why, why did I take this one? Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I think I think the robot lawyer is a reference to the, the the poor guy in the US who was recently found to have used Chat GPT to have written some of his uh, some of his submissions to the court in in New York. Um, and look, I think I think that's a very extreme example of how these technologies can go wrong and. It is very early days in, in the generative AI world. And for now, I think the consensus is that these technologies have an incredible ability to deliver productivity gains, but should not be relied upon outright in the way that this, this, this poor guy did in the US <laughs> to, to write anything that is going to be distributed publicly without a human being in the loop. So all of the headlines that talk about how generative AI needs to be stopped, it's an existential threat and, you know, it needs to be clamped down and regulated and some people saying it has to be stopped altogether. At the moment, based on what we as users of it are seeing, that, that seems to be overblown. And as long as a human is in the loop and as long as it's being used sensibly and should always be used within certain guardrails within an organization, there's no reason why it can't be used effectively by lawyers within our duties of confidentiality um, and with all of our other sort of professional standards. There's no reason why it's incompatible with those. You just have to, it, like I said, and I won't say too much more, but it always starts with your use case. So if you correctly define how you're using it as a lawyer with your duties of confidentiality to clients and your ethical standards, what we have done as a law firm is we've started very small with use cases that only involve using it as tools. So we can only use this technology to help us. We always have to be in the loop. We can never use the output verbatim. We always have to modify it. And if you look at it in that way, actually, it, it, it starts to be seen as, a, as like many other types of technology that help us in our day-to-day -day jobs. And it, it all comes down to how it's implemented, how people are trained to use it and how, how it's governed. Um, but I do think, I mean, going back to the question talked about requirements, look, it is, it is very likely that it will be regulated. Um, how it's regulated, of course, is the question. Some jurisdictions like the EU will have a very sort of hands-on approach to that. There's, there's already draft laws governing AI in the EU, but other jurisdictions like the US might be a little bit more sort of hands off. So we'll see something, but at the moment, Absent those requirements, it's just about using it sensibly and and within clear parameters. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, 
I'm not sure how many more questions we can take. I think we could just run in one more because uh, we ran out of time already. Um, from your experience with M&A deals and post-deal integration, is there a critical place for cybersecurity DD? I ask because there's emphasis on ownership of IP assets. How about processes, systems to protect these digital assets from cyber threats? Uh, the short answer is, is yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, there's a, a, a useful note that we put out on this, which we can share um, if people are interested in it. Um, but ultimately, uh, cybersecurity um, diligence is essential. If you buy, particularly in an M&A where you buy the whole company in and you own the thing after the event, then it's your cybersecurity issue after the M&A. So it's absolutely essential not to, A, because you're buying in liability, but also if you start integrating a, a what sometimes referred to as a dirty environment, with a, a difficult cybersecurity environment into your systems, that then could create a, a risk for you as well. So good cyber diligence is absolutely essential. Classic, the, kind of the big example everyone points to of where this went badly wrong was in the Marriott Starwood acquisition when Marriott bought Starwood. Starwood had a horrible data breach, um, or, or actually not even big, they were just being hacked on a regular basis. And um, it, it, was, it was a major problem for, the, for, for that deal and, and, and risk the, 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 the longevity of the company. All fine now, but yes, absolutely, do your cyber diligence. I'll do an elevator twist and just squeeze in one more. Um, what safeguards do you have in place and recommend to ensure that we as legal practitioners remain true to our ethical duty of confidentiality when adopting AI tools in the course of our work? Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's me. Um, I, I mean, I, I mentioned some of them already. So so start with, I think, I think the way we looked at it, to give you a buzzword to take away, is we, we looked at it as having three pillars of risk management. So to take away this idea of three pillars, so use case, and then operational, and then contractual. Those are your three tools, and there's lots of little things within those three pillars, but those are your three general tools for um, using AI ethically and safely. And you know, within those tools, to give you a flavor, use case, that's your use case design, that's your governance to reinforce your use case. So. You don't want your lawyers within your law firms to be using chat GPT on their personal devices for work. You don't want them to be using chat GPT or any other generative AI to create something that they're gonna use verbatim. You always want the human in the loop. Ideally, you wouldn't use chat GPT. I should have started by saying, you, you, but the terms of use for that are, are terrible for businesses. It's not really meant for business use, but um, start from your use case, get your governance in place to reinforce that look at your contract terms with your provider to make sure you own all the outputs and they can't do anything with the outputs. And then look at what the provider can do operationally to uh, minimize the risk that um, you infringe IP rights, that it uses personal data in a way that breaches data laws. Um, and then you're left ultimately with this, the residual risk of hallucinations and things going wrong, which, which is really down, down to how you use it again. So. That, that's the message. Use case, operational, contractual. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for that. Uh, thanks a lot, Will. Thanks a lot, Alex, for what I would say has been a very insightful and brilliant presentation. Nothing less than we expected. Uh, I was hoping that I'll pick one word uh, from today's session, and I did pick Sunakorn. I think I'm a Sunakorn now, so that, <laughs> that's a brilliant one. <laughs> Thank you, Will, for that. Um, but brilliant session. Thank you very much. I think the combination of the corporate side and the IP side is quite unique and very helpful for, for many of us. And I know a lot of our people are interested in intellectual property. A lot of people are interested in AI. I think that we will definitely ask you to come back and, 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 and I will then script the topic so that um, all our members jump in on you on, on the next session. But thank you very much for your, your help. Uh, Sele and the NLNG team, we're grateful to you. Um, thanks for showing up and thanks for all your support and help. Thanks for, to all the participants who showed up today. Thank you very much and God bless you all and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Have a Thank safe, you, Will. Safe rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.